All right. So first, uh, this is the last seminar of the quarter. Next week, there will be no seminar. And, and uh, we started the seminar with the alumni and we end the seminar with the alumni. So this quarter, I mean, uh, it's our seminar quarter <laughs> speakers. Um, so Rachel um, is the uh, branch chief for pedestrian and bicycle safety uh, in uh, Caltrans. Um, she's at some issue, she's an alumni, she's right in here. Um, actually, in my lab, <laughs> she said <laughs> she didn't want to mention that. Um, and uh, she uh, actually came in and did the uh, Pixar High Five study at that time and had a lot of fun on, on that project. Rachel went to collect all the transit, that, transit uh, bus transit data we can get from different uh, uh, districts, different uh, you know, cities. Um, and after her graduation, she went to uh, the city of San Francisco, worked for uh, the SF MTA, right? As a, um, you know, their program on pedestrian and bicycle safety. And then a little bit later, it moved to Caltrans, this before, I, if I recall. Yep. Yeah. And, and now is, she's in the headquarters on the city branch. And also, she's quite active at the PRB committees, and we're a member of the standing committee on pedestrian bicycle bicycle uh, um, committee and um, so today we're uh, very pleased to have Rachel give uh, us a presentation about the pedestrian bicycle program in Caltrans. Yeah. Well, thank you All so right. much Michael. Good afternoon everyone. Thank you so much for coming out on this Friday afternoon. How are you? My name is Rachel Carpenter. I oversee pedestrian and bicyclist safety with Caltrans, the Division of Traffic Operations. Um, and I'm here today to share a little bit about um, our program with you. I think it would be helpful before we start for me to sort of get an idea of who's in the room. Um, are you mostly graduate students? Yeah, everyone? Okay, with ITS. Do we have mostly engineers in the room? Okay, half, about half. Of, and then are the rest of you? Planners or planners? No. Nope. Policy folks? Okay, what else? Safe routes to school. Safe routes to school. Amazing. Traffic engineer. Oh, traffic engineer. Okay, I think that counts as engineering. <laughs> <laughs> Advocate. Advocate and active community members. Wonderful. Well, great. Thank you so much. Um, so I think I'll, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, in the next 30 to 40 minutes, I'll give you an overview um, of some traffic safety data. I'll introduce some of our statewide traffic safety data. Um, we'll go through the California Strategic Highway Safety Plan, um, including how it relates to our pedestrian and bicyclist safety program at Caltrans. Um, we'll then go through some of our division of research, um, research that's been completed that's sort of formed the programs for pedestrians and bicyclists now. Um, then I'll share with you the details of the first version of our uh, pedestrian collision monitoring pilot program. Um, then I'll go through the first version of our bicyclist collision monitoring pilot, pilot program. And I'll uh, share a little bit about our forthcoming uh, second version of the pedestrian collision monitoring pilot program. Then we'll conclude and I'll be happy to answer any questions. So this graph shows uh, fatalities and traffic collisions by year in California. It's uh, all public roads statewide data. Fatalities are shown on the x-axis, years on the, uh, I'm sorry, y-axis, years on the x-axis. You can see that since about 2010, total fatalities have been steadily increasing. This graph shows the same data. So fatalities on the y-axis, years on the x-axis. Um, the light blue bars represent pedestrian fatalities. The dark blue bars represent all other road user fatalities. And the red line represents pedestrian fatalities as a percent of total fatalities. You can see that increase that we noticed before since about 2010 in total fatalities. But the added value of this graph is that you can see pedestrian fatalities as a percent has actually been increasing um, since quite, quite a while before then. Um, as if that increase isn't in percent of pedestrian fatalities isn't alarming enough. What's more is that when you look at the amount of trips that pedestrians take, take out of total trips, 
it's not nearly equal to that percent. So um, according to our most recent California household travel survey, which was given in 2012, pedestrian trips made up, made up about 16% of total trips. But when we look at pedestrian fatalities, they make up about 25% of fatalities. But the state has a plan on how we're combating the uh, rising collision statistics. California's strategic highway safety plan is a statewide coordinated effort to reduce fatalities and serious injuries on all public roads. Uh, the strategic highway safety plan was started in 2005 and it's continually updated in order to ensure progress. The goal of California's strategic highway safety plan is towards zero deaths. This graph shows pedestrian related collisions, again, on all public roads in California. Um, you can see that since about 2012, pedestrian related collisions have been steadily increasing. The strategic highway safety plan has for several years aimed to address the needs of pedestrians at the state level and set achievable goals. Challenge area 88 of the strategic highway safety plan is uh, related to pedestrians. And action 1.2 out of that plan is to identify locations with pedestrian collision concentrations on the state highway system for traffic safety investigations uh, to be conducted by Caltrans. This action uh, was the impetus for our pedestrian collision monitoring pilot program. This graph shows bicyclist related collisions, again, um, all public roads, statewide data. Um, you can see that bicyclist related collisions were increasing, but have steadied off in the last few years. Challenge area 13 of the strategic highway safety plan focuses on bicycling. Action 2.5 is to identify a list of candidate locations for bicyclist related safety improvements on the state highway system. This action was part of the reason that we developed the bicyclist collision monitoring pilot program. As part of one of our uh, research projects, um, researchers at Berkeley developed this uh, graphic to describe transportation safety management. Uh, transportation safety management can be thought of as a continuum from reactive to proactive safety programs. Once we decided to develop a pedestrian and bicyclist collision monitoring program, we had to figure out where those programs might fit in on this continuum. To date, the dominant strategy used by most state departments of transportation is uh, what we call a spot safety approach. Uh, spot safety is an improvement at a specific location in response to a higher than expected crash rate or total at a site. Um, so it focuses on identifying locations that have experienced a, a, a history of collisions, what we call high collision concentration locations. I might ask that we hold questions until the end. Um, oh, sure. no, you know what? Go ahead. Okay. Where on that continuum is the most cost effective uh, treatment? Um, so I think that's quite a loaded question. I'm not quite sure um, what you mean by cost effective. It's important, and as I'll, as I'll describe later, it's always important to look at spot safety. So we always want to be looking at locations that have experienced collisions, but I think as I'll describe when I uh, talk through the presentation a bit more on systemic safety, we've seen that that is a cost-effective way uh, to allocate safety dollars. So That's I'll what get I was into thinking that. myself. Yeah, a bit more. So we use spot safety at Caltrans in our largest safety programs, what we call the table C and wet table C. Those are essentially looking at collision, uh, high collision concentration locations in wet and dry conditions. We also decided um, that we'd use spot safety as part of the first version of our pedestrian collision monitoring program. So I'm going to take a few minutes to describe how we identified the spots as part of the first version of our program. I think this will be helpful um, because as I explained in the first version of our bike and second version of our pet program, we've continually improved this methodology, so it's important to understand where we started. So if you can imagine for a second that this gray line is the roadway network and these black dots are individual collision locations. We use the sliding window method, which identifies a hotspot window, a fixed link that slides along the roadway network in order to identify a segment that meets necessary conditions to define it as a hotspot. So we've set a fixed uh, window length as 0.1 miles and a minimum number of collisions as two fatalities and or injuries. So this is sort of our threshold. 
we use the first crash as a start point and we measure up a 0.1 mile segment, so that's our window. We can see that there's two collisions, which meets our minimum threshold, and so we flag it as a hotspot. Then we move, we move through the network, we use the next available crash as the start point, and we can see that in this hotspot, we have three fatalities or injuries. So again, we mark that as a hotspot. In this next candidate hotspot, we can see that there's only one fatality or injury, so we're not marking that as a hotspot. And we continue to move through the roadway network. In this very simple example, we've identified three hotspots or high collision concentration locations, which have covered a total of 10 collisions. We've used this sliding window method across the whole state, and we've identified 129 pedestrian-related hotspots for investigation by our 12 districts uh, offices across uh, the state. So we sent out those 129 locations in July of 2016, and we uh, dedicated highway safety improvement program funding for any improvements that uh, came out of the investigations. We required our district staff to report back um, on progress, uh, both after two months and four months, and then all the investigations were completed in March of 2017. So it's important to remember that for the first version of this program, we identified locations just based on the collision record. We, at this point, we weren't able to calculate collision rates because we don't have pedestrian volumes across the whole state. So for the 129 locations out of the first version of the program, we just used collision record. What we realized after the districts came back on, and reported their progress to us that they, our staff could really use some additional pedestrian safety training. So we developed it. Um, we decided to uh, gear the training towards our district traffic safety engineers. And really the purpose was to learn effective solutions and best practices in the design and operation for pedestrian safety. We held a advanced version, what we call the advanced version of our pedestrian safety class in uh, January, so before the investigations were complete, um, so the district staff could use that knowledge to help inform their investigation. And we held a, a basic version of the course in September, um, in our district four office. And just recently, this last spring, uh, we went out to three different districts and trained uh, a lot of our staff at, at the district offices. So this is uh, a table that shows the outcome of those 129 investigations. So you, you can see our districts, our 12 districts listed as rows, and the columns represent different components of the program. So we had those 129 investigations. Uh, those were split up amongst our districts. 100% of those investigations are now complete. In March, I, I described those were all done. Um, and the outcome was 29 capital projects. So these were sort of big, um, larger projects that we needed to uh, design and program. So some of these were examples included rectangular rapid, rapid flashing beacons, pedestrian hybrid beacons, new signals, for example. The outcome was also 54 maintenance work orders. So those were simple fixes that we could send staff out to just make automatically. So uh, changes to signing, striping, um, small signal timing tweaks, things like that. So next I'm gonna describe a bit about the first version of our bicyclist collision monitoring program. Again, we, we have to ask ourselves, where might this, this new program fit in? We knew that we wanted to include a spot safety component. Like I was mentioning earlier, it's always important to look at locations where uh, there have been collisions. So we use spot safety in the first version of the pedestrian program, and we decided to use it for the first version of the, the new bicyclist program too. But we also decided we wanted to, to look at corridors. Uh, corridor safety is defined as an improvement across a corridor in response to a higher than expected crash rate or reoccurring safety concern along a corridor. If you think of bicyclist travel, um, it's, it's mostly along a corridor, so it's sort of like a, like a, more like a vehicle. It didn't make sense for us to implement if, for example, the outcome of an investigation was a bike lane. It wouldn't make sense for us to implement a bike lane on one block a spot location without connecting to anything, right? Like how, how useful would that be for you? So we wanted to include a, a 
corridor locations so that whatever um, improvements that were implemented as a result of the investigation really made, made sense when you thought, thought about bicycles travel. So for the first version of the program, we incorporated lessons learned from the pedestrian pilot, and we released uh, 252 locations to district staff in April of 2018. Uh, a year later, all of those 252 investigations were complete. And one of the, the lessons that we learned from the pedestrian pilot was this need for staff training. So in advance of sending out the program uh, to our district staff in April, we put together um, a sort of basic bicyclist safety course and we brought all of our traffic safety staff uh, from our district offices to Sacramento, well, a select number of them to Sacramento and we trained them on bicyclist safety. We're also planning to give more, more bicyclist safety courses in 2020. So I'm gonna go through a bit about how we identified the spots as part of the bicyclist um, collision monitoring program. We call the sliding window method. So that designates a hotspot window of fixed length that slides along a roadway network in order to identify segments that meet necessary conditions to define it as a hotspot. This is what we used in the first version of the PET program. Well, this approach is very intuitive. The problem is that it, the fixed window link leads to an inefficient hotspot definition. So you can see here, <clears throat> that there's empty space um, on this hot spot, first hot spot, there's sort of so some empty space here and then also in between the, the um, fourth and fifth collision. When you're, this might not seem like um, much of an inefficiency, but when you're thinking about it on a, on a statewide basis with 15,000 miles of road, um, lane miles, the, this sort of like little inefficiency really does matter. We decided to use a dynamic programming method to identify the spots instead. So when the sliding method, the sliding window method works, it, it slides once along a roadway network. What we decided to use is dynamic programming, which is more of an optimization framework to maximize the overall coverage of the hotspots. So instead of just sliding once, it slides back and forth. And here you can see that um, the hotspots are much more dense and there's not um, as much sort of space in them. So the next part of our program was, was a corridor approach, right? So we wanted to have uh, both a spot com component and a corridor component. But because corridor safety is, is sort of a new thing, um, that's not something we've used before in uh, our safety program. We had to define what a corridor is. So when we asked how should a corridor be defined, we thought, okay, well, maybe it should be a long segment with a high crash threshold. The problem with that definition is that it could be made up of multiple hotspots separated by large gaps. That, that wouldn't make sense for us. Um, even a single high collision concentration lo location could bias the results. So neither of those definitions really worked for a corridor. What we, what we came to is that a desirable feature of a corridor would be a long segment with multiple collisions that are occurring at some sort of regular spacing throughout the corridor. So we use that definition and um, we identified 252 locations between spots and corridors statewide. Uh, one of the lessons that we learned from the pedestrian pilot was that our district staff would really have benefited from um, having the locations mapped. So um, what you see here is a, just a screenshot of us mapping those 252 locations. So the, the red segments are the hotspots and the black segments are those corridors. It's sort of interesting here, you can see um, that a lot of, it's almost like we have a huge long corridor um, that spans the length of much of the Bay Area. There's, there's quite a few corridors that are reoccurring along this whole stretch. This is the outcome of those uh, 252 investigations. So we identified 96 corridors and 156 hotspots. All the investigations were completed, and the outcome was 284 new bicyclist safety projects. Next, I'll go through three examples of those 284 um, projects. The first example is in our District 3 um, in El Dorado County along Route 50 uh, from what we call the Y to State Line. For those of you familiar with South Lake Tahoe, this is just south of that. 
Um, as part of our program, we identified that little black corridor um, as one that needed to be investigated. But when our district staff went out and did their investigation, they realized that actually the roadway was very consistent, um, both geometrically and in terms of striping and signing, all the way from the Y to state line. So what they recommended as part of uh, the outcome of their investigation was a colored class two bikeway um, for that stretch, uh, colored in, in that it would be green, mid-block crossings and roadway lighting. As I mentioned when I was introducing the program, we have set aside special funding for the outcome of the investigation. So anytime our district staff goes and investigates a location and makes a recommendation, then there's we, we set aside safety program funding to automatically um, plan and design and build uh, their recommendation. Another example is in our District 12 along Route 1 um, from about Long Beach to Newport Beach. So this is a 15 mile stretch down in Southern California. Um, our program identified numerous hotspots and corridors all along Pacific Coast Highway. And when our district staff went out and investigated all of these locations, they determined that the improvement that would, that would improve bicycle safety was a con one continuous class two bikeway for that entire stretch, <laughs> a green bike lane treatments at certain conflict areas, warning signs, as well as a median island reconfiguration. So for those of you that are familiar with this area, that's really exciting if you've ever tried to ride down Pacific Coast Highway. It's a bit difficult. The third example is in um, our District 6 office along Route 63. So as part of the program, we identified uh, that red hotspot as a location to be investigated. Um, and when our district staff went out, they saw that actually between the arrows you see there um, was actually a gap in the bikeway. So the recommended improvement out of the investigation was a gap closure. So there'll be a continuous class two bikeway that will connect on both sides. Um, also, uh, in order to implement that bike lane, they had to reduce the lane widths. And once they did that, they were, they were able to redo the speed survey and actually decrease the speed um, for that stretch. So next I'm gonna talk about uh, version two, the, the next version of the pedestrian collision monitoring program. So again, we have to ask ourselves where, how might we wanna develop a program? Uh, what sort of safety programs should we develop? We knew we wanted to include spot safety again. But this time we thought we might want to include systemic safety. So systemic safety is an improvement that's widely implemented based on high risk roadway features that are correlated with particular crash types. So systemic safety is reactive in the sense that it relies on historical crash data to identify types of roadways that suffer from reoccurring safety challenges. But it's proactive in the sense that it provides a mechanism for um, improving roadways that, sit, that share design and operational attributes but haven't actually experienced a collision yet. So we decided we wanted to use systemic safety. This is also sort of new to our safety program. We had used it just once before in a roadway departure program we had. Um, so we sort of were, were stuck in this position where we have to develop a methodology. So in terms of the spot component of the second version of the pedestrian program, um, we will we'll return again to the formula that I mentioned for the first version. At that point, we, we only had the collision record. Remember that map I showed of the state that was green. We only had the collision data to, in order to identify those 129 locations. But we wanted to be able to calculate the collision rate. In order to do that, we need the pedestrian volumes though. But we don't have the pedestrian volumes. So we decided that we build an exposure model, a pedestrian volume model, um, so that we could calculate that rate. So we collected all of our Caltrans data um, on pedestrians, and then we put out a streets blog post, and we asked locals for their data, and the response was overwhelming. And we were able to map over 2,000 locations, um, including both our internal MyoVision location uh, data from MyoVision, and then also eco, eco counter uh, data. And, um, we also used 23 explanatory variables in order to build that regression model so that we were able to predict the pedestrian volumes at all intersections statewide. 
with this data then, with, with the volume data, we calculated the collision rate and we've identified spots based on that rate calculation. We also have included a systemic component of that program. So constrained resources are a continual challenge for state departments of transportation. And that's motivated some to identify more innovative and data-driven ways to allocate safety dollars. Um, a few state departments of transportation have begun using systemic safety, um, which according to FHWA sort of allows state departments to broaden their safety efforts at relatively low cost. Um, the basic tenets of systemic safety are to identify focused crash types and risk factors, screen and prioritize uh, candidate locations, select countermeasures, then prioritize projects and implement those countermeasures before collisions occur. We developed our own pedestrian related systemic framework in which there's sort of four steps and I'll go through those now. The first question we ask is what type of crashes are happening on what type of facilities? The second question then is what are the pertinent countermeasures and their attributes that we can implement at those roadways. In order to help us with a screening for the first question, we, we created lots of different crash matrices. What I've shown here is an intersection crash matrix. You can see along the rows are pedestrian movements and primary collision factors, and along the columns are different roadway features. So at the top, you can see uh, intersection control type, number of lanes in the main and cross street direction, annual average daily traffic in the main and cross. And we've collected uh, five years of pedestrian related data and we've populated this matrix. And what, what we see are what we're calling the systemic hotspots. So here, for example, um, you see this cell with 105 in it. That means that there's been 105 collisions that have occurred in a five-year period where the pedestrian was crossing in the crosswalk at an intersection, the primary collision factor was failure to yield. Who, who, who failed to yield? The primary collision factor is failure to yield. So just that alone doesn't tell us. Those 105 collisions occurred at signalized intersections where there were more than three lanes in the main, less than three lanes in the cross, and generally low volumes. What this also does, this tool we've created, is to tell us that we have 901 locations across our state highway system that have similar roadway attributes that might be at risk for that same type of collision. The second part, though, is even if we know those 105 um, collisions that happen at, at that type of roadway, uh, what sort of countermeasure are we going to implement? What we did was take that, take the matrix that we built and figure out which countermeasures might be appropriate to correct those types of collisions in those circumstances. So you can see in that cell where there was 105 collisions, that's red we identified 24 countermeasures that might correct this type of collision and would be appropriate to implement in this roadway scenario. This helps, the idea is that this helps at headquarters, we can sort of refine and narrow down what we end up sending to the district. So without sending, instead of having to send just lots of information, we can help refine the information and just send them a limited number of locations and a limited number of countermeasures that might make sense to implement. So the, the third sort of step is to create a primary, uh, a preliminary location list uh, for investigations. And we did that by cal calculating a weighted score. Um, you remember that 901, we had 901 locations across our whole system. We don't have the staff to send out to 901 locations, so we needed to sort of refine that even further. And then we wanted to provide our, st our staff with recommendations on which countermeasures they should, they should consider first. So in order to uh, refine that list of locations, we calculated a score, like I said, a weighted score. In order to calculate that score, we included pedestrian volumes, schools, proximity to schools, I should say, 
presence of a disadvantaged community, uh, population density, as well as job density. So all of that combined together to, for us to calculate a score for all 901 of those locations. And then based on that score, we can prioritize locations for investigation. What we then did is send, or what we planned to do, I should say, is, um, is send out those locations and also include um, this pedestrian safety countermeasure toolbox that we just developed. So when we send out those 24 countermeasures, for example, we want to make sure that our district staff really understand how to use those. And so what we did was uh, create this toolbox in order to help them figure out uh, what, what countermeasures, what sort of what a countermeasure was, how much it, should, how much it would cost, when it would be appropriate to use it. Um, and so we just finished that. And this is a toolbox that's available on um, by Branch's website. So to conclude, we've tried to use a very data-driven approach um, in the development of uh, the, the pedestrian and bicyclist safety program. Um, so these are new programs to Caltrans, and we've, we've used a spot approach for the first version, uh, a spot and corridor approach for the first version of the bike program, a spot and systemic um, approach for the second version of the PET program, We've, I think, realized the importance of staff training and um, also are trying to continually evaluate the programs and improve them as we go. I'm happy to take any questions if you have them. Okay, we'll open for question. Risho, uh, when we uh, people ask a question, we'll ask you to repeat it because uh, sure. it's broadcast on the web. Of course. Yeah. Do you do any like sensitivity analysis to that? how large that five-year window should be because if it's a time series, I don't know, maybe like different intersections are more dangerous, like, I don't know, some random time of the year, so maybe five might be too big. Or right, yeah, and that was something that we sort of did a bit of research on. We thought, oh, maybe three years would be enough, maybe we need to use 10 years of data, and we sort of looked at a lot of uh, other state safety programs, and that's why we decided to use five years because that's pretty common in the field. The idea is that with five years, that's probably uh, enough data to be able to take out that sort of year-to-year -year fluctuation. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty standard in the field. Yeah. For your sliding window method, how, what was the length of your windows and how many crashes constituted a high concentration? Right, and I'm sorry I didn't repeat the first question. So the, uh, this question is, uh, for the sliding window method, what was the length of our window and how did we determine how many collisions would, what was sort of the threshold for determining that it was a hot spot? So for the pedestrian uh, program, we decided that a 0.1 mile uh, window length would be used, and that's mostly due to the sort of localized um, way that pedestrians travel. Um, if you're looking at an intersection, 0.1 miles uh, includes usually like an intersection. Um, and we decided for the first round of the program that we would only need two fatalities and or injuries. Um, so the idea was, was that we wanted to keep it as small as possible to make sure that we we covered at least for the first version, um, you know, lots of potential hotspots. Yeah. Uh, for yeah. the corridor method, did you use um, just state facilities or did you include local facilities as well? That's a great question. So, and the question was for the corridor method, did we use just state, just state highways, system roadways, or or all public roads? These programs at this point are just focused on the state highway system. Um, because I work with Caltrans and we only maintain and operate the state highway system at that point. That's the extent of our program. Um, but I think um, ideally there's a lot of opportunities where we could work with local governments uh, to help them do some of that safety analysis. Um, and I think right now what we're thinking is that not that we do it ourselves and include it in this program, but that we provide tools to local agencies so that they could do this same sort of thing on their roadways. Yeah, um, um, how did this transfer work? Like, if you um, you've done this statewide analysis, and then there is great value for local uh, agencies to replicate this work, um, as you said. So, how does the transfer work? Like, um, do you actually do you, are these tools actively used by local agencies to your 
So if I'm understanding your question right, um, it's how how the methodology is used by local agencies. Um, how we transfer this? So you've done this work. It's only, only like it's posted on your website, and local agencies are notified that they can use it, or they are required to. Uh, so at this point, it's not used by local agencies. Um, I was hired by Caltrans in 2016 to develop a pedestrian and bicyclist safety program, and so what we've done now is try to. Uh, develop the first versions of the program and then working on the second, I guess just finished the analysis of the second version. And um, we're just doing the analysis for the state highway system and we haven't um, given tools to low local agencies yet. We wanna make sure that we understand what works best on the state highway system and then in the future give, give the sort of tools to the local agencies to do similar type analysis. Um, how that's gonna work out at this point, I'm not sure. Um, Along the lines of having the tools for the local agencies, um, some of the safety funding that comes to the state, is there a movement to uh, disperse that more proportionally in relation to the number of pedestrian collisions between the state and the local agencies? Because all the data I see shows a lot more pedestrian uh, collisions on local roads, but the state uh, system having about half of the safety funds. Right, yeah, so um, the question was if there was a sort of discussion that's being had about reallocating safety improvement uh, dollars amongst local and state agencies. Right now, for background for everyone, uh, the Streets and Highway Code requires an approximately equal split of highway safety improvement dollars that come from the federal government. So the federal WHWA sends us safety dollars at Caltrans we distribute per statute, half to local agencies. We keep half for the state highway system. And the, the question was whether we're thinking about reallocating that because regularly about 65% of collisions do occur on local roads. Um, that's not something that um, I think that, that Caltrans is considering. It's really, it's in statute, so that would be a change that the legislature would have to make. Caltrans, did Caltrans consult you in its opposition to the complete streets bill, given that you're... SB 127? Yeah. Um, I didn't have all that much uh, to do with SB 127. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was wondering, like, what is the difference between uh, reactive and proactive uh, safety plan? Sure. Is, like, uh, reactive planning more towards, like, following the guidelines of ASCO? Whereas like a proactive is all about implementing like the systemic changes in the NGO's plan. What is the difference? So the question of what what's the difference between a reactive and a proactive safety program? That's a great question. Um, probably one that I could have articulated better. So when we talk about reactive safety programs, we mean that we are focusing on locations where there are um, collisions that have occurred. So locations where we know there has been at least for these programs, pedestrians or bicyclists that have been killed or injured. When we talk about proactive safety programs, what we mean is that we're implementing changes to the roadway improvements before a collision occurs. So the whole premise behind systemic safety is that we look at locations that have experienced collisions. So for example, if we see that lots of pedestrians are getting killed in locations that don't have sidewalks, that's sort of a reactive program because we've looked at the collision history. But then a proactive program would be, okay, well, we're gonna take that data and we're gonna implement sidewalks at locations before pedestrians get killed. So when we talk about reactive and proactive, we're talking mostly about whether there's a history of collisions. Yeah. What were you the previous questions? Uh, in terms of how to measure um, it works for proactive and the reactive. For the reactive, you can compare the current data versus the historical data, but in terms of for the proactive, how do you measure the success of a program? The success, yeah, I think that that's a great question. Um, so we have, systemic safety is, is sort of new to Caltrans, and we haven't been in a position where we need to evaluate it at this point. I think you, that there still is merit in using collision data, to do that in uh, evaluation. Um, I think that that's still something that we're working through. 
So basically, 20 EV is all about like implementing the systemic changes in the MPO's plan or the state highways plan. So um, the question was, was what is exactly proactive safety. It's it's more about implementing a change to the roadway before there's a collision because we think that there might be a risk for a collision to occur based on the roadway. So um, you still look a little confused. If if we if we know that that a pedestrian is more likely to get hit, if the data shows that there when a roadway doesn't have a sidewalk and and pedestrians are, and there's more pedestrian related collisions at locations without sidewalks, then we go to a location that doesn't have a sidewalk, that also doesn't have a history of any pedestrian collisions. And we say, well, we think that maybe because there's not a sidewalk, a pedestrian might be at risk for getting hit. So before, before they actually get hit, we're gonna implement a sidewalk. So it's sort of doing, instead of waiting for collisions to occur and us reacting to those collisions, it's us thinking about where there might be correlations between collisions and roadway features than, than implementing changes in advance. So it's in a way, uh, we, can we uh, sort of spread around and I see you, uh, <laughs> yeah, you, talk, you know, try to raise your hand. Yeah, it's okay, yeah, let me go, let him go first. And I, I, I just had a comment. So yeah, based on the approaches uh, you introduced, uh, it seems that so that approach is both detection, quality detection, might be used for vehicle to vehicle collisions as well. So do you have a plan to apply it for vehicle to vehicle or it, are there already many research people that have done that? Yeah, that's, I think that's a great program. So at Caltrans, we have a number of different safety programs. Um, we have a handful that look at a different vehicle to vehicle collision type. So a uh, roadway departure, cross median, um, all sorts of different crash types. At this point, all of those programs uh, use hot spot, spot safety instead. I think that there is sort of the way the field is moving is more to systemic safety. Um, and we might see that happening um, in some of our safety programs. Um, I oversee pedestrian and bicyclist safety. So I, th I think at this point, um, I'm not sure if the sort of the vehicle side of the house is doing doing much in terms of looking at corridor or systemic safety. Okay. Uh, Justin? Uh, so when Caltrans relinquishes control of the state highway to a local city, you don't share any of the data or any of your findings with the local government on the state control? So usually uh, the question was if we relinquish um, a, a segment of highway, then um, do we share do we share data? Um, so usually a, a relinquishment will happen once, um, and so we'll, we'll hand over a segment to a local agency, um, and then usually that's then owned and operated by the local agency. So the, this program, as it relates to this program, doesn't look at locations that have been relinquished. Um, SHSP, they're starting a new five-year program soon at the... We were at we were participating in the it's at the beginning or before the beginning of the last five year program and I remember seeing some data that fifty percent of the bicycle fatalities were at intersections and one of the state highway intersections that is quite critical is uh, highway ramps and. Um, I'm wondering if you could go to the chart of the, of, I guess, bicycle collisions and point out where ramps is on the chart. So I'm not quite sure I know what chart you're talking about. Uh, what uh, chart the one that, that you said failure to yield? That one oh, of, uh, okay. Um, so this is, that was part of our, um, so, that's pedestrians. This is pedestrians, yeah. So what the way um, the way that we're sort of working the program is that we develop the first version of the pedestrian, then the, the first version of the bike. This is the second version of the pedestrian. So we haven't we haven't developed a systemic program for okay. bicyclists yet. So this is just looking at pedestrian related collisions. Okay, where are ramp endings on that? So because ramp 
uh, termini are a roadway feature, that would be something that's collected along the columns that's not related to a collision, and so that wouldn't be collected along the rows. At this point, for the pedestrian-related program, we didn't include ramp termini. All that we've included is uh, intersection control type, number of lanes, and uh, volume data. <coughs> Hypothetically, what we could do and what we may do when we're developing a systemic program uh, for bikes is include more roadway data. So if we had information about where all our bike lanes hypothetically were, we would include that and that, that would be more information that would allow us to further segregate those cells um, than to determine systemic hotspots. So you, you, are you, you mentioned ramps, you're meaning that the, the ramps, you know, the, the, the intersection connected to the ramps, right? Because oh, people, the ramp, the ramps. people don't walk across the ramps. It's just come to the surface street and they interact. It's so the like, state is pushing it off to the local jurisdiction. Um, so actually we have, uh, we do have right away at the end of our, at our ramp. So we do make changes um, off, you know, at, at the intersection. What we did as part of the first version of the uh, bicyclist monitoring program was that we actually looked at collisions that occurred at the end of ramps. And the investigation, the location we sent out was actually all four of the ramps. Uh, so the whole, the whole sort of ramp uh, intersection. We didn't just send out one leg of the ramp because we understood that any sort of improvements at any investigations should really address all the ramps because they're pretty similar. And so when we sent out the locations for the bike, the first version of the bike, we included um, a segment that would include all four of the, the ramps. Okay. Um Eldorado County is the fifth safest county in the state for pedestrians. Um, that's because it's so scary that nobody walks in Eldorado County. Um, so, of course, it's safe. Um, could you show me where a signalized uh, one lane in each direction uh, intersection at a ramp would be on there? So the only roadway data that we've included at this point with the first version of the systemic program is just the control type, number of lanes, and, and average daily traffic. So, um, we, so the 812 total is uh, not the real total of pedestrian fatalities, if that's what you measure? So that is the real total. It's just not separated, segmented further by additional roadway features. That's something we could do. And, but and the fact fatalities are shown in there somewhere. Correct, yeah. This is five years of pedestrian related okay. data, fatalities and injuries. Yeah. Is there, are there any other, I think, did you have your hand up? Yeah, just real quick. Just um, what was kind of the uh, methodology of determining what, what features to include in this graph by, by row and then yeah. your weighted features? Because you can throw in as much stuff as you want in that weighting. I mean, you, you could do it both ways. It doesn't really matter, does it? Yeah, um, well, I guess, so the question was how we decide, how we decided to include those roadway features as part of the, the development of this matrix. Yeah. Um, that's a great question. It's, it's, con, con, it's continually those sort of trade-offs that we had to make. How much do you include? Because the further you segment down the data, then sort of the, the less number of locations that you have. And so this was because this was, I mean, really, I can't emphasize enough that this is a new program. So. Um, we, we haven't done systemic safety much, so it was sort of us learning a lot. We decided we wanted to include sort of the, the least amount of information at this point, partly because we don't have a lot of information on roadways. We don't know where all of our crosswalks are, for example. But then also because we wanted to include sort of a larger sample size so that it would help us learn better. If we had a very small focused program, we might not be able to learn as much in order to improve it for the next version. Yeah. So, sorry, I'm trying to quick question. So, for the when you made your street blog post, I think you mentioned that you had people provide their collision data. How did you have people like provide their data? Was like a mapping data that said like here was where a collision, or how did you go about it? Right. So the the street blog post that we put out was actually for volume data. We have collision data for all public roads. Um, but when we asked, what we wanted to do was to be able to calculate a collision rate. What we needed was 
the number of collisions over the volume. So if there's three people getting hit at this intersection and only three people use it, that's different than if three people you know, are killed at an intersection and a thousand people use it. Um, so what we did was put out this post and we asked for volume data. And um, we got, we, I think one of the, the learning, the takeaways for me was that we didn't ask for it in really like specific formats. And so we got CSV files and we got maps and, and everything. And it took like a lot of work by some amazing researchers at Berkeley, affiliated with ITS actually, um, to go through and, and figure out all the data and make it useful. So um, we weren't very, I think, strategic and clear about what, what exactly we wanted, which was part of the problem, but it ended up being really useful. It just took a little bit of work. So, Rachel, um, in the, uh, you know, you developed that model to predict the volume. Yeah. Um, did you verify with some, you know, sites or? Uh, yeah, we did. Um, and we actually um, overlapped it with the streetlight data too to, to compare. Um, I think we, the researchers felt confident enough to use what we, what we had, but we did tweak the model a bit. Um, I'd have to go back though and look exactly what sort of changes were made. So it's calibrated yeah. and checked with uh, yeah. other data sources. Yes, yeah. Well, it's um, the work that you're doing, um, some of the systemic um, improvements being implemented in Caltrans standard maintenance and new construction guidance so that we don't build things that need to be retrofitted? Yeah, that's a great question. So the question was whether or not um, we're taking some, some of this systemic approach and implementing it in some of our other programs so that instead of, so that we, we build roadways um, that, that take into account sort of safety in advance of collisions occurring. Um, at this point, we've, we've really just finished the analysis um, on, for, for pedestrian related systemic. So I think um, what we will be doing in the coming months is working with our shop program and working with asset management to try to make sure that um, we sort of build into the program um, some features sort of in a standard way. That's not something we've done though. One quick question. So you mentioned earlier you uh, you need a regression analysis using like 23 variables. Yeah. Did you ever run the risk of having multiple in your model? Can you repeat the question? So we created this exposure model, pedestrian related exposure model, and we used 23 explanatory variables. And so the question was whether we can you repeat? Multicollinearity problem. Oh, whether we looked at multicollinearity. Um, and you know. I believe so, but that's something that was done at Berkeley by their researchers. So um, they did publish a paper on the model, so I'd be happy to make that available to Anne Marie to send out. Great, okay. well, thank you yeah, all yeah. so much for attending.